Here's some words from Frederick Buechner. I hear you are entering the ministry, the woman said, down the long table, meaning no real harm. Was it your own idea or were you poorly advised? And the answer that she could not have heard, even if I had given, and the, the answer that she could not have heard, even if I had given it, was that it was not an idea at all, neither my own or anyone else's. It was a lump in the throat. It was an itching in the feet. It was a stirring in the blood at the sound of rain. It was a sickening of the heart at the sight of misery. It was a clamoring of ghosts. It was a name which, when I wrote it out in a dream, I knew was a name worth dying for, even if I was not brave enough to do the dying myself and could not even name the name for sure. Come unto me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you a high and driving peace. I will condemn you to death. If we answer God's call to join this ancient order of pastors, and if we have any sense at all, we ought to speak our yes to this call with a lump in the throat, that stirring in the blood. We're saying yes to a profound mystery that lights a holy fire in our bones. But this yes will require real courage, because we're saying yes to a kind of death. Death to our ego, death to our safety, death to the pursuit of power, the demand for upward mobility. I think it's pretty obvious to most of us that the North American church suffers a bewildering crisis of pastoral fidelity. And our vexing problem is not merely that we have the wrong ministry paradigms or need to retweak theological categories. Our problem is that we have not taken our ordination vows seriously. I'm not sure that we're actually ready to follow Jesus. We're not prepared to come and die. In 1999, my wife, uh, Miska, and I moved to Denver, Colorado. And I was a couple years into ministry, a couple years fresh out of seminary, sort of brimming with idealism and all the ideas that I had in my head of what it meant to be a pastor, what it meant to help a church grow. And we went to Denver for my wife to go to grad school. And there was a small church that had been through, I think, three splits at the time. They couldn't afford a full-time pastor, and I was like all they had. And so they offered me a part-time job, and I took it. And I stepped into that space with a lot of vigor and a lot of ideas. And I think maybe I was only four or five, six weeks into the job, and I planned a, uh, an evening. I think I called it a night for visioneering. Y'all should groan at that. This, this, this is the key to groan. And I had a big PowerPoint presentation. And I was, you know, probably, I don't know, 27, 28 years old at this time, with all my vast experience. And I was going to tell this struggling church how we were going to turn things around. And I had a PowerPoint presentation to help me do it. And I did what, you know, we pastors sometimes um, do. I began to tell the church what we were going to value. <laughs> tell the church what our values are. And there was a really long list of them. I don't know, 13, 14 things that we're going to value. And my ideas were really creative. I mean, there were things that these dear folks had just never thought of before. Um, we were gonna we were gonna be missional, and we were gonna live life together. They'd never you know never we were gonna have small groups. Um, it was really radical. <laughs> my my big reveal was that we were gonna change the church name, because you know if you just change the church name, people just start flocking. That's what happens. And there was a moment uh, about halfway through this unfortunate litany where Mike, and he was at a table, kind of like right over here, and he just kind of raised his hand, and Mike said, so when? Are we going to pray? And I stumbled, and I looked down at my list, and in that moment, I had 
uh, a real problem? And I think my answer was something like, sure, yes, yes, prayer is assumed. You know, it's underneath everything, which is pastor speak for I've been caught. And I went home and I began to think, why did it actually not even cross my mind for one of our values to be one of the first works of the church, which is to pray? Those days, uh, one of the, the elders came up to me and after church on a Sunday and handed me a book and said, when, I think that you'll really enjoy this. And what he handed me was Eugene's Working the Angles, the Shape of Pastoral Integrity. And he handed it to me, you know, when, I think you'll really enjoy this. And I realized later what he meant was, when, I think you really need this. I think this was actually, this was actually the copy he gave me. And uh, I went home that day, that afternoon, and did my favorite Sunday afternoon thing, nap. But before I, I dozed off, I opened up the first pages, and I was only a couple paragraphs in, and my heart was smitten. This is the opening lines that I read. American pastors are abandoning their posts left and right, and at an alarming rate. They are not leaving their churches and getting other jobs. Congregations still pay their salaries. Their names remain on the church stationery, and they continue to appear in pulpits on Sundays. But they are abandoning their posts, their calling. They have gone whoring after other gods. What they do with their time under the guise of pastoral ministry hasn't the remotest connection with what the church's pastors have done for most of 20 centuries. A few of us are angry about it. And I will say, this is definitely Eugene's angriest book. A few of us are angry about it. It is bitterly disappointing to enter a room full of people whom you have every reason to expect share the quest and commitments of pastoral work and find within 10 minutes that they most definitely do not. They talk of images and statistics. They drop names. They discuss influence and status. Matters of God and the soul and scripture are not grist for their mills. The pastors of America have metamorphosed into a company of shopkeepers, and the shops they keep are churches. They are preoccupied with shopkeepers' concerns, how to keep the customers happy, how to lure customers away from competitors down the street, how to package the goods so the customers will lay out more money. Some of them are very good shopkeepers. They attract a lot of customers, pull in great sums of money, develop splendid reputations, yet it is still shopkeeping, religious shopkeeping. The marketing strategies of the fast food franchise occupy the waking minds of these entrepreneurs. While asleep, they dream of the kind of success that will get the attention of journalists. The biblical fact is that there are no successful churches. There are instead communities of sinners gathered before God week after week in towns and villages all over the world. The Holy Spirit gathers them and does his work in them. In these communities of sinners, one of the sinners is called pastor and given a designated responsibility to the community. The pastor's responsibility is to keep the community attentive to God. The pastor's responsibility is to keep the community attentive to God. It is this responsibility that is being abandoned in spades. So he goes on to describe the angles of pastoral ministry, which are scripture, prayer, and spiritual direction. And the, the image he uses is a triangle. And he says these three angles of scripture, prayer, and spiritual direction are these hidden necessary hinges on which everything else turns. He says there's lots of other things that make the, the visible lines that most of us actually look at in the triangle. He, he calls them preaching, teaching, and administration. I think you could add a lot of other things to that. He says these are the things that most of us see, but what's most essential is the angles. These angles describe the pastor at work 
and at rest in her natural habitat. Prayer, scripture, spiritual direction, these are the deep well that nourish our life and work. They're the nourishing water that we drink before we have any clarity or any wisdom about anything else we're supposed to do as a pastor. These pastoral angles set the boundaries, the direction, the ethos for whatever work that follows, whatever else might be required of us. And here's the thing. Each of these angles are about God. God is the burning center. So there I am, reading Eugene on my Sunday nap, and here's the bolt of lightning that strikes my soul. This bolt of lightning that jolts me out of my slumber, and that I realized began to awaken in me a very profound ache. Being a pastor is about God. So as I was thinking about um, being with y'all today, and I was starting to feel sheepish, a little empty-handed. <laughs> here I am going to be at Ted's, at the Henry Center, with this earth-shattering news that being a pastor is about God. It felt like being at the International Congress of Mathematics with this stunning revelation that two plus two is four. But at some point, if this God-consumed reality is merely assumed, like me in prayer, if it isn't boldly named, guarded, cherished, revered, renewed, reinvigorated, then it becomes a faint memory and a shadow. It doesn't carry any living fire. After 28 years of pastoral ministry, it seems to me that the situation isn't much different. We talk about God a lot. A lot. We have immense theological categories to help us properly speak of God. We have moral theologies to help shape us toward the kind of life God envisions for us. But God's self the God who burns in the bush, the God who thunders from the mountain, the God who rescues Israel out of Egypt, the God who hangs on a cross and descends into Hades and rises victorious, the God who in the flesh of Jesus Christ joins humanity to the tri triune reality and ascends to the Father, carrying humanity with him in the burning heart of divine life. This God, this living God, who loves us beyond measure and calls us to risk everything to follow. I am not at all convinced that this God fills our pastoral imaginations. Maybe we're in a time like the days of Josiah when they found the book of the law buried in the temp temple's dusty stacks and they read it and heard the stories once more and felt the quake in the soul the kind of quake that happens when we become freshly aware of God. The king tore his robes and called the people to come and hear these holy words from their living God because God was their central reality, their existence, what they must have if they're to live. And think about Jesus as he entered his public ministry, his baptism by John. What did Jesus apparently need? The voice of God the Father speaking over him and to him, you are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. What the Son needed from the Father was this direct encounter with the living words of God. What we need, what we require, is God. I recently um, read a, a reflection from a, a pastor who was making its rounds, and it was on 10 reasons to join the church. Here's a few of them. I, I won't read all of them, but... To join a church is to commit to a social circle you do not get to choose and can therefore show you whether your spirituality is real or fake. 
Joining a church is a way of practicing among a small group of people over a significant period of time what you'd like the world to be like. To join a church is to live in rebellion against the neoliberal and capitalist forces which are brainwashing you into making your consumer desire the center of the world, reducing all your experiences of the world, including all the people in it, to instruments and resources. Joining a church is to organize your life around a time to confess your limitations, culpability, and imperfections together with other people so that you can get used to receiving divine forgiveness and hope in response to your honesty. I'll just read one more. To join a church is to resist all traditional loyalties to state, party, culture, family, or affinity in an act of loyalty to a group that transcends all natural categories. Now, there's some poignant and necessary wisdom laced in those. But God barely gets a mention. At least not the God revealed as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Jesus, the animating life of the church, the one for whom we are his body, is completely absent. And maybe if we were to concoct our list in the room today for reasons to join a church, maybe our list would be different. My guess is we might suffer from the fact that our list's problems may actually be more subtle because the word God would probably get heavy play. Trinitarian reality would be infused, I'm certain. But would God be the center? Would God be the animating reality? We need a far deeper ecclesiology. An ecclesiology centered on the fact that we exist because God has acted in Jesus Christ. The miracle of the church is that we're here. <laughs> Despite everything, we exist, and we all know it's not of our own making. We are God's doing. The church is not a social experiment. We are a people made possible by the risen Christ and the indwelling spirit. Our hand-wringing over the troubles we face as the church, and we face a lot of them, but our hand-wringing may say less about our future and more about we, what we actually believe the church is. And if we don't understand what the church is, a community created, sustained, and animated by the triune God, then it will be impossible to know what a pastor is. The situation that Eugene described in 1987, pastors abandoning their vocation of attending to God and helping the people attend to God is no less dire now. Maybe we do need some other images. I mean, a lot of people who read Eugene, you know the shopkeeper image kind of the moment you hear it. But maybe that word doesn't work for us. You know, we, we don't usually talk about shopkeepers, and it sounds a little bit quaint. Maybe we need some new words to help us hear the stark truth. Maybe today we should say that pastors have metamorphosed into platform builders or influencers, conservative firebrands, or progressive deconstructors. Perhaps we're tempted to think that a pastor's job is to be a chaplain to the social order, whether the order of the right or the order of the left. We're very tempted, depending on what group we happen to be in, to build a reputation for being provocative or polemical or coy or moderate or silent. In our polarized reality, there is a powerful temptation to find our niche and then to work it. To say whatever the right people want to hear or to say whatever will make the wrong people enraged, all so that we can get the approval of whoever it is we think we need to approve of us. We maneuver to secure a following, to build a successful church that makes us feel good about ourselves. We work to win at the religious game, and we use God to do it. I think it's a red flag for any of us particularly those who might call ourselves pastors, if we find that we actually never say any difficult word, we never preach any unpopular text, we never 
actually move in a way that cuts against the grain of whatever our group happens to be. Dangerous. Eugene, uh, one thing I think is really interesting, is he's, he's really known for his critiques of the megachurch. And certainly there are plenty of concerns to grapple with that project. Though I should say that Eugene's thoughts here are, are a little more complicated than we like to remember. But, but here's the thing I think is interesting in our moment, at least in a number of circles, certainly not everywhere, but a number of circles, it's actually the easiest thing in the world to lampoon the megachurch. I mean, that's easy now. Anti-megachurch is now kind of its own club. And then we can feel smug again that we're doing church the right way. Until whatever that we create in response to the megachurch then becomes our new idol. And then the next wave lampoons us so that we can finally get it right. And it's just like, never ends. The problem is our addiction to models, to movements. The point of the church is God. The point of being a pastor is God. But this pull to be admired, to build a religious career, it's magnetic. And the seduction is especially strong in the pastoral vocation. In fact, what I'm here to say is I believe it's, the temptation is perhaps the highest among us pastors. It's really hard sometimes to see in ourselves because we always have God's name attached to whatever it is we're doing. We use Bible verses and theological themes, and they too easily cover our self-deception. So we need to hear the Spirit's call afresh. Our hearts need to be arrested again to fill the danger and peril of our treacherous predicament. We need to be wooed back to our first love, our first calling. We desperately need the Holy Spirit to renew within us the most basic truth of what it means to be a pastor, what it means to take on these vows, to bend our knee and declare Jesus Christ as Lord, to love God with all of our heart and our soul and our mind as we give our life away in service to God's church. We need to have our imagination undone and then remade by the reality of God. This was the ancient wisdom that Eugene referred to when he spoke of what the church's pastors have has done for most of 20 centuries. In the 6th century, Gregory the Great wrote his Book of Pastoral Rule, which is one of our earliest and most foundational books explaining the very heart of what it means to be a pastor. Converts were coming into the church in droves, and Gregory recognized we desperately need pastors, and so he wrote this book of pastoral rule to train, to call out, to invite pastors. And where would you go, if you were Gregory, to find candidates? Well, it was the monasteries. So that was his first place to go and try to recruit new pastors. But here was the problem. The monastics, one of the problems, not the only one, but one of the problems was the monastics were so committed to their life of contemplation and prayer their life of attentiveness to God, that they didn't want to become pastors. Because they were scared that they might move into um, the realm of the empire and that they would, they would be seduced by power, by money, by political prestige, by social, uh, the, the magnetism of, of social power. And they thought, I am too committed to God to become a pastor. Now, Gregory understood this. In some of his letters, he, he wrote a lot about his own fears of being seduced by the empire. But he also knew that God always moves God's pastors toward people. God always moves the pastors toward the places of pain. God always moves pastors toward the people that God loves. I mean, can you imagine today? I mean, I can imagine people not wanting to be pastors because, you know, the church is a mess or the pay is not great or you have no idea what to do with disintegrating denominations. But I have never talked to a seminary student, I've never talked to someone considering holy orders who says, you know, I've thought about being a pastor, but I just love God too much. I've thought about being a pastor, but I just, my heart is pulled toward prayer. We need to be far more concerned about the health of our soul. 
because these seductions are killing us. And while Gregory was calling pastors to become pastors, he was convinced that they actually were naming the right temptations. <laughs> the temptations were right, but the invitation is to follow God even into the valley of temptation. We evoke God's name for our self-saturated pursuits. We use God language, God categories, but our energy, our boiling anxiety, the pastoral literature and conferences we consume has a whole lot more to do often with our vanities and the dominant American project than with God. We can easily use God ideas and God words to accomplish a myriad of ends. But God is the end. God is the end toward which all our theology moves. God is the end of all the church's vision. God is the end of everything we mean when we say the word pastor. God is the end of whatever we mean when we speak of being human. God is the end. Of course, our casual dismissal of God, it's not only an issue for pastors. Abraham Heschel insisted that it's actually humanity's fundamental crisis. What Heschel referred to as the systemic liquidation of man's sensitivity to the challenge of God. And Heschel insisted that in light of this crisis, what we desperately need in response is more embarrassment. This is what Heschel says. The cure of the soul begins with embarrassment. Embarrassment at our pettiness, prejudices, envy, and conceit. Embarrassment at the profanation of life. A world that is full of grandeur has been converted into a carnival. And I'd like to say I think it's the same for the pastoral vocation. Pastoral work that is full of holiness, wonder, and grace has been converted into a carnival. It's a time for a renewal of the spiritual discipline of embarrassment. And this crisis traces back to the reality that we live in a world where we have been shaped to believe that God is peripheral to what it really means to be human. That we as individuals define our deepest desires and joys and hopes. And that those desires are first our first necessity for human flourishing. And then, perhaps, depending on sort of where you land on your metaphysical questions, perhaps God becomes one way that some of us try to get those necessities met. And we shouldn't at all be self-satisfied, none of us, because this is true across the spectrum. From the most progressive church to the most conservative, these assumptions are the air that we breathe. It's what Charles Taylor described as the imminent frame. It's the loss of transcendence that Andrew Root describes in his remarkable work. Once we assume that cultures define what we most need, and that then our job as pastors is to scramble and give what people are convinced they must have, and we are lost because God doesn't make the list. I mean, sure, God as a therapeutic salve, God as a catch-all category for our many attempts at self-actualization, that God is perfectly acceptable, requires nothing of us, and ultimately delivers nothing capable of rattling us out of our malaise. That God is not powerful enough to raise the dead or heal a shattered story or enact justice in Chicago or L.A. or Israel or Gaza. That God, as Hauerwas would say, is not even interesting enough to deny. But the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God revealed in Jesus Christ, the God of cross, resurrection, and ascension, the God who is creator, life, and Lord, the God before whom every knee will bow, the God Robert Gentian described as whoever raised Jesus from the dead 
having already raised Israel out of Egypt. This God, this is the God powerful enough to actually remake a world. This is a God before whom we tremble. On August 13th, 2017, I stood in front of our church in Charlottesville, Virginia. You might remember that was the Sunday after 11th and 12th where the Unite the Right white supremacist rally came to Charlottesville. For us, it wasn't a weekend. It had been months. We knew that this was coming. Churches and police and different nonprofit groups and had been organizing. And on that Saturday, standing downtown, being in the midst of that, um, seeing the violence, the hatred, surrounded by smoke, um, bloodied people laying on the ground. Uh, I thought, I will never, unless I somehow happen to be in a war zone, I don't think I'll ever be submerged and surrounded by so much evil and hatred. And they called the um, emergency, state of emergency, dispersed the crowd, but then the, those who were the United the Right folks began to just go to different parks and continue their uh, nonsense. And uh, there was a park that was close to my house, so I ended up there. And, and there was several hundred people, and this guy was standing up on a, a picnic table. And I realized a few minutes later it was, it was David Duke. And the things that were being spewed out of this, this mouth um, was vile. And in our church, sir, uh, a lot of activists and a lot of people deeply concerned about um, what's happening in our city as they, they should be. And I remember Sunday morning waking up really early, very groggy, heartbroken. Um, and I did have this haunting question in me, like, is what I'm about to do, does it matter? What I just saw on those streets, the evil that I just saw, and the action that must be implemented to resist this, um, is it foolish of me to stand up before our community and call us to worship? Maybe we should be doing something else. And what got renewed in my heart is that that's precisely where the church must be turning our attention and our heart toward the God so that we can actually be shaped as the kind of people who know how to respond. The act of coming before God in humility and prayer to proclaim the reality of God, to announce both the risen Lord's judgment on evil and promise of renewal for all creation, to circle around a table where we are gathered into the truest story once more, to name every competing story as a lie and a sham, this is exactly where God's people are called to be. We must be shaped by worship so that we know how to live as God's people who heal rather than harm, who love and act at great cost to ourselves if necessary. It is a failure of pastoral imagination to think that God who created this world for all goodness and flourishing doesn't care about justice. In Jesus Christ, God is justice. And it's also a failure of the pastoral ima imagination to think that we can enact justice without the crucified and resurrected Lord. Because in Jesus Christ, God is justice. Justice is not first an idea or a principle or a law. Justice is Jesus Christ. Being a pastor is about God first. But then that means, because of the way of Jesus, that right on the hills of that, being a pastor who's about God turns us toward the people that God loves. We are called to love and serve and care for and guide and struggle with those that God has entrusted to our care. Michael Ramsey, former Archbishop of Canterbury, spoke a line that just, I, it never leaves me. Being a pastor is being with God with the people on our hearts. Being a pastor is being with God with the people on our hearts. 
To be a pastor is to be with the people and to give God's beloved people whatever God has given us to give them. And here's the thing. What we have to give, all we have to give, is God. In John Updike's 1960 novel, Rabbit Run, there was a young, very modern, very put-together clergyman. He goes to an old pastor, Pastor Fritz Krupenbach. He's an elder Lutheran. Been around the block more than a few times. And he comes looking for advice and how to best help a couple in his parish. And he goes on and on with all this sort of pastor speak, you know, all this gobbledygook. And Krupenbach just listens as long as he can, and he reaches a moment where he has had enough. This is what he says. Do you think this is your job to meddle in these people's lives? I know what they teach you at seminary now, this psychology and that, but I don't agree with it. You think now your job is to be an unpaid doctor, to run around and plug up holes and make everything smooth. I don't think that. I don't think that's your job. You don't know what your role is or you'd be home locked in prayer. In running back and forth, you run away from the duty given you by God. On Sunday morning then, when you go out before their faces... You must walk up, not worn out with misery, but full of Christ, hot with Christ, on fire. Burn them with the force of your belief. This is why they come. Anything else we can do and say, someone else can do and say. They have doctors and lawyers for that. Now, I'm serious. Make no mistake. There is nothing but Christ for us. All the rest, all this decency and busyness is nothing. It's devil's work. Antoine de Saint-Exupéry said, if you want to build a ship, don't drum up the people together, the wood, divide the work and start giving out orders. Instead, teach them to yearn for the vast and endless sea. God is the sea. And our first job isn't to run a religious machine or organize religious labor. Our first job is to yearn for God and to walk with others as they yearn for God too. This is the pastoral vocation as ancient as the Christian story, as necessary today as it has ever been. I am pretty convinced that we are desperate for a new awakening of pastoral fidelity. Saturated, consumed with, burning with, sacrificing with the love of Almighty God. And I pray that God will give us holy courage to follow God into whatever future the Spirit has in mind for us. Um, I just have a couple of announcements for us. The first is I'd like to encourage all of you, especially if you're pastors in the room, um, to check out the Eugene Peterson Center that Wynn directs at Western Seminary. So you should, if you can, go to their website um, at petersoncenter.org, see the good work that they're doing there, sign up for their mailing list, get involved. I really think it's an important vision um, in line with what Wynn was saying today. Um, also, I just want to quickly call your attention to our next event. So we're done now for the semester, but we will be back in January. You'll see on your table these cards. Uh, on January 25th, we have Christina Beaver Lake from Wheaton College coming to give a lecture on poetry as theological invitation. Um, so we really would love to see you there. Please do come if you're able. Again, it will be a Thursday morning at 11 a.m., and that's on January 25th. Um, at this time, I'm going to invite Wynn back up to the stage, as well as Pastor Juliet Liu, uh, who is a Trinity graduate and pastors at Life on the Vine Church, uh, just about 15 minutes down the road from here. Uh, we're really glad that she's with us this morning. She's going to um, offer a first kind of response to get the conversation started, maybe a question or two, and then we'll invite all of you uh, to join in the conversation. There's microphones here 
on the right and left in the room as Pastor Juliet invites you. Please do bring your questions. Uh, we'd love to carry on this conversation in a way that's helpful to everyone. So again, um, we're grateful for Pastor Juliet, her ministry, and uh, that she's here with us this morning. Well, thank you. Wynn, thank you again. Uh, I had the opportunity to read through Wynn's lecture last night, so I was able to savor it a little bit more than you all are able to. Um, uh, but I've been asked to respond just for a few minutes from um, just sort of my perspective as a, a pastor of a local congregation. Um, you know, when after hearing what you've shared, primarily what I want to do is to just make space for, um, for prayer and for repentance. I don't know if, if you're anything like me as I, as I listen to Wynn speak, some of the words that he uses to describe uh, how we often see pastoring um, really resounded with me and not in a good way. So maybe there were moments throughout this lecture where you found yourself and your soul just going, ouch, right? That kind of names a lot of our temptations in a really clear but kind of painful way. Um, so uh, shopkeepers, right? The pastor is a shopkeeper. Um, the pastor as a platform builder. Uh, pastors as chaplains to the social order of either the right or the left. Pastors as influencers securing a following. So something that Wynne said was the pull to be admired, to build a religious career, it is magnetic. It is magnetic, and I think some of us, we know that magnetic pull. And the seduction is especially strong in the pastoral vocation, all the harder to see in ourselves because we always have God's name attached to what we're doing. We use Bible verses and theological themes, and they too easily cover our self-deception. So I would just love to make space just to give a little bit of time for silence, um, to just let those words kind of resound within us um, and lead us maybe into, into repentance, into sorrow for what the pastoral role is often turned into. So would you just join me in some silence as we do that? God, we confess we are easily deceived. We confess we often forget our first love, and it is you. We repent for the ways we so urgently and frantically build our own kingdoms, all the while neglecting the giver of life who is making this world new. And let us hear the Spirit's call afresh. Let us be wooed back to our first love and our first calling. Let us return to God, the God who burns in the bush, who thunders from the mountain, who rescues Israel out of Egypt, who hangs on a cross and descends into Hades and rises victorious. The God who in the flesh of Jesus Christ joins humanity to the Trinity and ascends to the Father, carrying us with him into the burning heart of divine life. This living God, Help us to yearn for you, God, like the vast and endless sea. Amen. So I just want to share a couple of things as a, as a pastor in response to what I've heard when talk about today. <clears throat> you know, one thing that I think that you say very clearly is that the pastor's responsibility is to keep the community attentive to God. Um, and I love that quote from Eugene from Working the Angles, right? The, um, the biblical fact is that there are no su successful churches. There are instead communities of sinners gathered before God week after week. And in these communities of sinners, one of the sinners is called pastor and given a designated responsibility to keep the community attentive to God. Um, it reminds me of something I recently read by a Mennonite pastor, Melissa Flora Bixler. Um, she, she writes, there's an old story that in the 16th century, 
Anabaptists chose the least essential person in the community as their pastor. That way, when persecution came and the pastor was inevitably killed, the community would not lose an essential service, like a cobbler or a mason. Melissa writes, while I can't establish the veracity of this story, I attend to its wisdom. I am non-essential personnel in the strictest sense. And while I'm sure my church would bristle at this description, it's a truth that shapes my pastoral identity because my church has all the gifts it needs to proclaim the gospel in word and deed, to love one another and the world, to be the body of Jesus. My congregation tasks me not with filling in the gaps for what they cannot do, but instead with paying attention. So I love this idea of that attentiveness to God and attempt attentiveness to one another as being central to wh who we are as pastors and what we are called to be. Um, I love this humbling, it's kind of like a humiliating and a humbling reminder that as a pastor, I am one of the sinners of the church and that I am non-essential personnel. My church has all they need to do what God has called them to do, but I am tasked with paying attention. Um, I asked my sons, I have two sons, they're older now, but when they were younger, I asked them, how would you describe what I do for a living? Like, how would you describe what it means to be a pastor? What do you see me doing? Because I was curious how they would respond. And one of them said, um, you spend time listening to God and telling others about God so that their lives can be full of, of God. And my other son said, you run the church. <laughs> um, guess which son became my favorite son that day? <laughs> no, I, 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 I share that because I, I find myself always being pulled between those two visions for what it means to be a pastor. Am I the runner of the church? Is that what God has asked me to be? Or am I someone who is tasked with paying attention, paying attention to God, paying attention to others? Um, when I think you so beautifully name this vision for pastoring, it's a call to death, right? It's a call to die. It's a dying to platform building, to ego fluffing, to people pleasing. Um, I also want to name that when I return to this vision of pastoring that Wynne has presented, um, it's also a call to life. It's a call to freedom. This vision of pastoring sets me free. It frees me from the pressure to be more than what I am. Um, and so each week when my co-pastor and I meet on Tuesday morning, we, we have about a two and a half hour meeting every week. Each week we're like, oh, there's so much to do, there's so much to do, let's just spend a little bit of time praying today and then we'll get into the work. Uh, we always end up spending much more time than just a little bit of time because once we enter into prayer, our souls remember this, this is what we are called to do. It, it sometimes feels like an inefficient use of time. I sometimes imagine trying to defend to other people the time we spend in prayer together. It feels inefficient, and yet it also is the engine, I think, for what we do together each week as pastors. Um, and last year, I took my first sabbatical as a pastor. Um, and do you know that while I was away, my church had the nerve to keep on going? <laughs> they had the nerve to keep on loving God and loving each other and serving the neighborhood. Um, and for me, it was uh, learning in a new way that I am non-essential personnel. Uh, and it was horrifying, and it was freeing, and it was life for me. Um, so I think that's all I want to share now. I want to make sure we have a lot of room for Q&A. Um, but, you know, I've already mentioned some things that for me as a pastor I've had to learn. How do I cultivate a life in which I am freed to see pastoring as a call to pay attention to God and to others? Um, so as... So I, my first question is going to have to do that, but I think I'm supposed to mention, if you have a question you'd like to ask, there are microphones set up here in the room, so you're welcome to line up um, and bring your question to Wynn. Um, but Wynn, my first question for you is, um, can you give us some insight into, you know, 28 years as a pastor? 
I feel like as a pastor who, who's been doing what I do just for nine years, I want to learn from anyone who's done it for, for 28 years. Um, so can you give us some insight into what were like the personal practices or like a rule of life that you cultivated over those years that enabled you to be a person who could be attentive to God? Um, I, w I was, when you were saying your first um, thoughts, I just was, was thinking about this book that, that Eugene and Marva Dawn wrote together. It's called The Unnecessary Pastor. Um, it didn't sell very well, <laughs> you know, um, but that imagery of, so I just thank you for um, naming that so clearly. Um, um, <clears throat> I mean, I don't think I have anything remarkable to say uh, that, that um, the spiritual teachers before us hadn't said really cl plainly, which is, I do think, you know, uh, Sabbath for me was, was really important. Um, I don't think the way we do that is as essential, but I think s some part of our life where, where I was consistently saying my work ends, <laughs> um, I, I needed tangible ways to, to say this doesn't depend on me mm -hmm. because in my anxiety, um, and you know, we, the two primary churches that I pastored um, were always on the edge of chaos, it felt like, for multiple reasons, I mean, good people and not like strife, but just um, helping a new church form and pastoring a university church that was like 85% college students. Mm -hmm. So we were just always in chaos. And um, so the way my anxiety could play out was to just, just to work all the time and not draw good boundaries. And again, this is one of those places where it can be really seductive because I was doing really good things. <laughs> I was I was preparing better sermons, or I was um, with more people out having conversations, or I was meeting with more leaders, or what have you. Um, but oftentimes, if I was really honest with myself, what was fueling it was anxiety that I would screw up, and that I wouldn't succeed as a pastor. And once I like looked in the mirror and saw that plainly, that um, it scared me. Um, because I realized that I was, I was um, meddling with like holy mysteries, <laughs> and I was I was grabbing the horns of the altar, and um, that's a dangerous thing to do. And I also have a wife who um, pretty plainly told me I was stepping into dangerous territory. So um, Sabbath became a very important rhythm for our family, um, and then in the communities of, of leadership within our church to um, constantly be coming back and asking, like, what is the heart of what we're really doing? And are we willing to fail to, for something to not be polished um, if it means that to do that is going to be disingenuous and it's not going to actually be, be moving us more deeply into God? Are we going to, am I going to um, trust God enough to not be polished. Um, and then just the basics of, of prayer. And, and for me, um, I had to learn different ways of prayer. So I love to uh, run in the mornings. Um, well, not really run. I, I move my feet in the same direction for a while. Um, with a little bit of bounce, bit of bounce right? <laughs> yeah. One, uh, one woman one time said, I saw you running today, and I, and I asked her, like, did, did I look like a gazelle? <laughs> she was like, N no. <laughs> um, but I just found that that was, that was, for a long season, a good space for me to pray. Um, sometimes, I mean, my writing, for me, is active prayer. Um, it pulls me attentive to God. So just finding those ways to, to be attentive to what's real. Thank you. Yeah, so Sabbath... Uh, giving yourself, learning to give yourself permission to not be polished. Um, and um, what was the last thing you said? Oh, running while you, running while you pray, praying while you run. Yeah. 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 That's great. I, I, something that sticks with me too that you said is that uh, you can be doing a lot of good, right? You can be doing a lot of good. You can be helping a lot of people, but that's not necessarily drawing you closer to Jesus. 
in some ways, sometimes that can be uh, something in between, something pulling you away from Jesus. And I, um, I remember after my first year of pastoring, I, um, one of the questions I agreed to ask myself every year I try to do like an annual examine. One of the questions I ask myself, it's not like, have I grown as a preacher? Am I better as a pastoral counselor? It's just a simple question of, am I, am I more like Jesus after one more year of pastoring um, than, I, than I was a year ago? Um, and that's been central because you can be doing a lot of good. You can be doing a lot and yet not actually becoming more like Jesus or growing closer to Jesus. So thank you. Uh, other questions? Can you introduce yourself? Hi, then, um, yeah. my name is Jeff. I work here at Trinity, um, and I'm, I'm a student here as well. Thank you, Dr. Collier, for your words and for uh, your encouragement, even in the sense of revealing those things which we oftentimes know are issues, but maybe we uh, feel we've talked about it so much and nothing will change, or we can't see a way forward. As my question uh, relates more to what we're doing here as, at Trinity, and we're seeking to form women and men for ministry contexts, for the call that God has on their lives. Many people are going into pastoral ministry. What are some words you would have liked to hear when you were in our position, or some things you would have liked to be reminded of, habits and ways of living and ways of thinking that we could begin here that would allow us to not only see our own needs and weaknesses more clearly, but cultivate a healthier ministry, a more Godward ministry going forward. Um, <clears throat> you know, where, where my mind and heart goes is to the most simple and basic thing. I, I think that what we most have to offer is ourselves. Um, I know this room and these halls are filled with immense, like, erudite knowledge, and we need, the church needs that. I mean, we, we, we need our best minds, our, our best practitioners. Um, but I, but what really transforms a heart is encountering another person so enlivened by God that you find yourself drawn to the heat. It's kind of like the um, Antoine de saint Superi alliance of, you know, I do think we can start with drumming up people to uh, gather the wood and divide the labor and give out orders. You know, we can, we can start with drumming up the skills and exegesis and homiletics and theological inquiry, and we absolutely need those. I mean, the, the thing about those lines is, when you're, you're building a ship, at some point you do actually have to, you know, cut the trees and, <laughs> and form the, you do that, but that's not where it starts. And I just think, and, and, and I couldn't say for your institution, I'm not 100% sure I can say for mine. And I, um, I think we struggle with this question ever immensely, is how do you keep God as the deep reality? How do you do that? How do you become a community of prayer? Not prayer as activity, prayer as deep attentiveness to God. Not prayer even as something you feel all the time, that's not the point, but that we're constantly returning to God over and over again. Um, you know, when I was in seminary, uh, what I would have loved is if there was at least one or two more people that when I left that place, I thought, I'm not 100% sure what I learned from you, but I wanna be like you. I wanna know God the way you know God. I want, I want to believe so deeply in the good news of Jesus Christ for the world that whatever is animating you animates me too. It may look really different, I may practice it in a different way, I may have some different theological convictions, but I, I am, I am compelled to move toward Jesus the way you are. And so, again, like as simplistic as it, as it might sound, I don't know how to do it other than to more deeply become a community that's more enthralled with 
the person of Jesus Christ. Other questions? I have a lot of them, so. <laughs> um, oh, yes. Thank you, Dr. Collier, for being here. My name's Jeff. I used to be a student here. I'm a pastor now. Um, so someone recently described my job for me. Um, they said three parts, uh, teaching, uh, counseling, and administration. They didn't mention prayer, but, you know, we assume it. Um, so that, that's one thing that I'm, I'm grateful for that point. I'm, I'm wondering about that third point, the administration. Um, and I, I think I've gotten a sense in some of Eugene Peterson's writings, like, that he personally like drew a line and said, I don't do that. Like as you put it, Juliet, I don't, or as your son put it, I don't run the church. But I'm wondering, is that, is that the, the reawakening they, like we need, like not to do that stuff? Or is, it, is there a way to do that um, that's attentive to, to God, to the deeper reality? I'm really glad you asked that question because I think these are the kinds of things we do kind of trip up on a little bit. You know, there's a few things that Eugene, I mean, they, they, they strike us as so stark because it feels so, like, impossible or contrary. Um, it's kind of like when Wendell Berry writes about, you know, he owns a typewriter, not a computer, and everybody's like, ah, and they think that his whole point is to, you know, say we should all go out and buy typewriters. Um, so a lot of people talk about this. Um, and I've thought about it a lot because I think there's kind of twin dangers. One danger is to go so literal with Eugene that we start getting like micromanaging our job descriptions in a way that actually confines us. Eugene was a particular personality. He was expressing God's call on his life and his community. Um, toward the end of his life, Eugene was asked, what's the thing you're most grateful for? And he paused for a moment and he said, that I got to be Eugene. And, and then he would say other things like, you have to learn how to be you. <laughs> so there's a real danger of getting overly literal with, but I think there's a, a tw another danger, which is um, once it becomes only a metaphor, we're like no longer forced to really grapple with the concrete teeth. And I think what, what Eugene was adamant about is that it is now assumed by the way we actually spend our time and by the perceptions of most of the people that we pastor, that our fundamental job is making sure the church runs properly. And he said, absolutely not. That is not our fundamental job. That doesn't mean that we won't have responsibilities there, but there has to be, you know, like, so in a situation when you're being given that kind of job description, I do think it's a little bit of um, an alarm for a conversation about what's not on that list when the most essential isn't on that list. Um, and so, I mean, I think most of us, and even Eugene, like he, he didn't run the church, but he, he did, you know, he, he did oversee the session. Um, he did sort of manage the staff. Uh, so it wasn't quite as, <laughs> separated as some might get, but I think what he was trying to say over and over again is we have, we have to do a radical reevaluation. We have to return to basics, and that might feel stark to some people. Thanks, great question. Hi, my name is Daryl. I pastor a local church. Resonate with so much of what we've heard today, and yet I would love to hear you put together for us um, how to process that statement of non-essential personnel. Don't necessarily recoil from it. There's something really attractive and settling about that, but to consider a passage like Ephesians 4 that gives us a a unique and particular role in the development and growth of God's people. Surely that's not just 
running the church. That's, that's shepherding and, and, um, and praying for and carrying the people on our hearts. How do we process that assessment of non-essential to a work where God has described it as he has uh, in, in that text? Start with that, since you... Sure, although, yeah. Um, yeah, thanks for that question. I, I think, so actually similarly to what, how you just kind of responded, I think that there is something that that language um, helps us name about the kind of posture that we can carry as, as pastors, as teachers, as preachers, that, um, that everything is up to us. Um, and that nothing could happen in God's church apart from us, right? That, that kind of both the, both what could be the ego of that, but also the, just the weight of that, and that there's something I think for me that that language pushes against to remind myself that like, it is also true, right? That it can be true that God gifts the church with, uh, with teachers and pastors and apostles and, and all, all of those gifts. Um, that can be true at the same time that in God's providence and because of the spirit, the church has everything she needs, even apart from me. So I, I am not more essential, I guess, to the church than any other person is, is essential to the church. Um, and I, there's something about that language I appreciate because, because in my drivenness, in, in the burdens I choose to carry and the responsibility I choose to carry as a pastor, that that language of non-essentialness helps uh, it provides like a counter narrative for me about who I am and what part what part of the picture I play. Um, so I mean, I think it's true. no one is not no one is non-essential. Um, everyone is essential, and I'm included in that. Um, but there is, you know, I in the same way that you would say like there's there's a way that that statement has teeth to it. Like I want to grapple with the, the way that it challenges me and pushes back on. Uh, the self-importance that I sometimes carry as a pastor. Yeah, um, I would say something kind of similar, and I, but I would say um, I think reading Eugene and Marva's book, The Unnecessary Pastor, says it way better than I could, because, I mean, hopefully from what you heard from me, I would in no way say in one sense, a pastor isn't needed. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm my part of my life's mission is now to like to plant a flag in the ground and say. God, may God raise up more pastors where the church needs this. And yet, it's almost like a good metaphor. A good metaphor will, will shock us enough to make us rethink assumptions. And so, I think in the unnecessary or the unessential, it is forcing us to, to, to grapple with how necessary do we actually think we are versus this being God's doing. I think coupled with this is one of my favorite essays from Eugene, which is, Lord, teach us to care and not to care. And it's like both of these things are true, that we have to learn to, to care more deeply about the things God cares for, and we also have to learn to care less. Um, and I think it's kind of in that same category, that there's something about that language that frees up some space in us to not be undone, as she was describing, by the oppressive tyranny of thinking it's up to me. But that, to say we're unnecessary doesn't mean we're not necessary. <laughs> Uh, my name is Andy. Uh, I'm a student here. And uh, my question, and I don't think you said this, but it can be taken that w we need to just be with God and then that somebody could be so, could turn that to being so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. Um, and, it, and it can even be in the same way that we do theology and and spending time learning and knowing about God, knowing God, being with God. Uh, and, and I don't think you said that, but could you um, maybe expound a little bit? You, you brought out some issues of, of justice, uh, Charlottesville, which maybe from a distance and, and now with a distance of time and history, that, that story has been so um, reduced depending on who you're, you're listening to or who, what, how you're remembering it. But uh, the, 
so, and, and some maybe don't even think that our role as Christians is to deal with justice at all. Our, our role is just to know God and to preach the gospel. And, and so how can we um, avoid the trap of, yeah, I am, I am leaning into God so much, but now I'm really not doing any good for anyone here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, first I would say you're, you're absolutely right. And I, don't, I actually don't think it's possible to be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good because I, I think that means you're not being heavenly minded. <laughs> um, I think the model of the true human is Jesus Christ. The God revealed to us in the person and body of Jesus Christ. The true shepherd is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was from the very beginning moving into the world, into the places of pain. And Jesus was doing this out of the will of the Father, out of deep knowledge, deep knowing, deep intimacy with the Father. And so there, to my mind, there, there is no, like, there's nothing at odds here. And if there's something at odds, then we need to adjust our understanding in theology um, to, to, to think that um, prayer does not move us into a, a heart that beats and feet that move and a voice that speaks as Jesus would speak and act and live and be and move in the world is a false gospel. Um, but it also means that the way we move and the words that we speak and the actions that we do are actually growing out of the person of Jesus Christ, not out of the narratives that are handed us from some other power. Um, so, and I think it, it, and it looks, how someone is called to move is very different depending on your, the calling of God in your life, the, the, the particular skills or vocation that you have, um, the places where God has put you. Um, but the dichotomy between those two things ought not exist, and if it does, then that's the first sign of a red flag. Thank you. Yeah, we have time for one more. Thank you. This is Chen. I'm a student here. Uh, I just want to ask when you mentioned the monastic way of like uh, re reject being a, a pastor, reject the temptation. But uh, because we are here, we are, uh, this is a seminary here. We are the topic is about education. So I want to ask you, what do you think about the monastic way of training pastors comparing to our modern ways of training pastors in seminary? Because monastic monastic ways of training pastors the the very uh, the emphasize discipline first, like the spiritual discipline. You have to get up, get up very early and pray and pray and enjoy prayer and love prayer. Your whole heart is devoted to God. But now it's knowledge, knowledge, knowledge. You know, we have some kind of a formation group, but it's far, far, far not enough comparing to most monastic way. So, do you think that the like uh, the pastors now they are so weak in their spirit, like they, they are overwhelmed by all these things to do? And they, they lost. They lost their like first love of God. Is it is it like originally from the way we train pastors in seminary? Like, if you were the dean here, what would you change? Like, do whatever way you want. Yeah. Thank God, I am not the dean, or will never be a dean anywhere. Um. Um. I feel like this would be an easy place to say something controversial. Um. And I don't feel the need to do that. Um, I think all of us, I, my, my hunch is that almost all of us would say something is amiss in theological education. I, I just don't think that's that controversial. Um, I do think that um, I'm always drawn to the little underground seminary Bonhoeffer started, and I always mispronounce it. Can somebody remind me what it was? Funkenwald or what, what was that? Yes, thank you. Um, I, every time I read stories about what was happening there, um, it was, it was, it's deeply meaningful to me of this integration of scripture, life, community, action in the world, and it was all because of Jesus. <laughs> um, so I think, you know, again, I've only been in a seminary working for three years. I don't spend, frankly, much time myself thinking about the large project. It's not my wheelhouse. But I do think that you're identifying something that is at the pulsing heart of our struggles, which is 
we must find a way to return again to um, the light and life of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit at the center of how we are being formed, and that it, it doesn't become another, like a, it's one of the reasons I don't love, like, spiritual formation or spiritual theology sort of being thought of as a pillar within a seminary, because everything we do <laughs> ought to be forming us toward Jesus. Um, so I don't have any answers, so it's not really fair for me to, like, be too strong on it, but I think what you're identifying is a problem. Will you join me in just thanking Wynn again for his lecture?